sliced by Matilda, torched by Bash, crushed by Killalot, tossed, trampled, twisted, torqued. Chainsaw to hack into Major Tom's shell, and don't forget it's a garden water barrel. That shell, oh! There goes the head. Lead the way. Oh! And all around you are losing their head. Can you keep yours? No. No, no, no. Out of the arena. Oh! Dear, oh dear. Matilda. Tasting. Matilda in on Dreadnought. Lifting it away from the flaming pit. Sir Killalot, there's the kill cam. Lifting up. Oh, that's really good. A lift on Dreadnought. In comes the axe. Dreadnought here in terminal decline and incline. ruffling the feathers of the house robots and they seem to have gone berserk they're angry they want revenge a demolition demon is bearing the brunt of their anger
how did it all start? Well, it started really um, in 1997. Um, I'd heard rumours about a programme which involved um, a lot of little vehicles or sort of robots all fighting with each other. And these were not just radio controlled cars, these were something sort of a bit heavier. And I thought that sounds really interesting. We only had six and a half weeks to build everything and design everything. We were up against building four fighting vehicle robots capable of fighting against other robots and smashing bits off of them, and at the same time looking good as well. basically five processes involved in, uh, in making robots. There's the, uh, the drawing or the sort of concepts stage. There's working out the drive system and building the chassis. There's working out the weapon system and putting the weapon system onto the chassis. There's the covering, which can be anything from metal to fiberglass to plastic to wood in some cases. And then there's the testing. And you need to do an awful lot of testing, otherwise <laughs> you're in a real problem. <laughs> Fairly early on, I, I set myself the criteria that these robots need to turn on the spot. There's, they have to turn on the spot, because in this tight studio environment, if you can't turn on the spot, you can get yourself wedged in a corner and you'll never get out. So really that ruled out completely things like uh, car driving with two wheels at the front driving um, and, and wheels at the back pushing you along. So, uh, and it ruled out most conventional forms of, of mobility in terms of the way that even dumper trucks or anything like that work. Tanks are good, they steer on, they can turn on the spot. A, a, an army tank or a digger, like a, a, a caterpillar vehicle or anything like that can turn on the spot. So tank steering works well. So there was no reason why we couldn't have wheels, two separate wheels, that operated just like tank tracks. So when you told them both to go forward, it went forward. And when you told the right one to go faster than the left one, the vehicle turned to the left and in the opposite direction, it could turn to the right. The other thing that, that that chassis could do is it could spin on the spot and it could reverse out trouble very quickly. So this is a really good example of a basic robot chassis. What we've got here, this is actually a four-wheeled chassis. The house robots are all two-wheeled with the uh, extremities supported by casters. This one doesn't need casters because it's got four wheels. It's actually known as a skid steer chassis, but its basic principle and all of its drive gear is exactly the same as a, as a typical robot chassis. What we've got, we've got um, the wheels, the tires, linked through a chain, through a pulley block here, onto a pulley belt to the motor. Now this, from the motor to the tyre, is known as the drivetrain. This is replicated on the other side, exactly the same on the other side here, <clears throat> and it's the turning of each motor individually that gives us the actual driving of the robot. So what happens is this motor here starts to turn, turns this belt here, which turns these outside wheels here on this side, and the robot will spin round to the left. Now the control of this side is all done by this clever little device in here. This one is a Vantec speed controller, a very accurate system, and they're very reliable as well. We've been using them in the house robots now for about three or four years. And if they can drive a robot as heavy as Sergeant Bash along, then they can drive most competitors' robots quite happily. <coughs> we, it's all linked via a safety cutout relay here. So that what happens is, if there's a problem with the robot, we can just turn off the whole power supply to the robot via a relay, a safety cutout relay. The other safety device, because in Robot Wars obviously safety is a crucial issue, is the safety link. The link is, uh, is effectively like a switch, but it's much more reliable than a switch, because sometimes with switches, when you have high current switches on robots, they can get damaged, they can either get smashed in the, um, in the fight process, or the two links of the switch can fuse together, so that it means the robot is permanently on. With a link like this, if this link is out, then there's no way at all that the robot can, can work. It's a very good safety device. So we have our power supply to our speed controller. There's a whole 
system is controlled by the trans by um, radio control. This, here it is. In this case, we're um, running on uh, 35 megahertz. This one, um, we do run on 40 megahertz sometimes as well. <coughs> it's a standard sort of um, eight-channel radio control box. Everything is controlled in this case on the right-hand stick. The driving is on the right-hand stick, and uh, that's basically a general sort of uh, robot chassis. So, uh, and, and I thought, well, uh, a chainsaw is a good, good weapon. It won't necessarily destroy metal, but it might cut through the plastic outer casing on some robots. It'll cut through aluminium, certainly. So that would be a good robot. And, uh, and I thought, well, it'd be nice to maybe to sort of stick that out at the bottom of some sort of robot, because it's a bit funny. It could look like a bit like a tail. So that was the sort of like the basis of, of Matilda, really. And, and, I, and I thought, well, the, the other important thing is that these robots all have their own personality. They all look very individual. They don't look like metal boxes because that's almost certain what the competitors' robots are going to look like. These all need to be, have like personalities and need to sort of imagine where they could have come from. And in Matilda's case, it was some sort of wild robot sort of pig from outer space that was probably used to, to go around and saw up logging and something, something like that. This is no waltzing Matilda, but if Matilda dances with you, it's a dance of death. Her tusks can rip and pneumatically flip. It's a breeze, Matilda. Her spinning rear flywheel is 27 kilos in weight, the matriarch of mayhem, the mistress of mischief, Matilda. Now, let's have a look at Matilda naked, shall we? Something that you don't see very often. Here we are. This is the front off, this is the back. All made in fiberglass, as I mentioned earlier. Here is Matilda's chassis. The basic robot shape here. And drive, the same drive chain, same type of wheels. The motors are hidden down underneath these batteries here, which I'm sure you won't be able to see. And we've got the speed controller on the top here. Same cutout, same safety cutout links. This Matilda has a lot going on in the front and a lot going on at the back, so we have to heap up all its control system on top of it. But the basic principles behind all of it are exactly the same. Matilda's weapons, flipping tusks, toss robots in the air. It's done by two rams underneath here. These are um, powered by carbon dioxide, which comes from the little bottles at the back here. It's all controlled by, the, uh, by a separate set of um, receivers. In the house robots, all the house robots, we have a separate drive box from a uh, weapons box. So it takes two people to control each house robot. The reason for that is if you're going into a fight, you have no time at all to actually get your weapon ready to, um, to flip somebody or get ready to put your axe in or, um, or your, your chainsaw or your flamethrower or whatever. So we have two people. One person's concentrating on the weapon, one person's concentrating on the drive. It just means you get much faster response time in terms of attack, which means you're actually more likely to do damage to the opposition. And it's devastating disc on the back here. Weighs 22 kilos and does one heck of a lot of damage. So in the Robot War studio, we tend to have one person that looks after each robot. The advantage of that is that one person knows all of the intricate insides and workings of that robot, so if it goes wrong, if it breaks down or it gets broken in the studio, then that person is able to fix it very quickly and get it back on again and back up and running. I'd like you to meet James. James is Matilda's daddy, if you like. So uh, James, do you want to talk us through sort of uh, how Matilda's changed since the first years, because we're now at Series 5. Yeah, well, it, it's amazing looking at it now, actually, because there really isn't much left of the original Matilda that I built all those years ago. Um, these tusks are completely rebuilt and have got these big sort of dump tanks which dump air into the air ram, which flips the robots up. Um, that's new. I think um, it's just this strap here probably is the original bit. <laughs> I know, no, that wasn't even there. I, I just had it all wobbling around on the top. Yeah, that's why um, his cover fell off so many times. James was responsible for seeing Matilda naked more than once. Yeah, and on her back. Yeah, these yeah. speed controllers, they're all new. Um, the drive system's probably original. And uh, there's more batteries actually powering everything. And of course, um, I had a chainsaw in my day. Um, but apparently this is uh, it's a lot beefier. So James is most... Um, uh, famous of course for 
sculpting up Matilda. And in fact, these thumbprints here and here are James's original thumbprints. So let's have a look see, see how they fit. Well, he's put on a bit of weight since then, I'm afraid. <laughs> he's got a bit, a bit lardier. What a lot of people don't know, of course, is Matilda has soft horns. Everybody thinks they're steel, but of course they're not soft. They're soft. James, um, where do you get those from? Well, they're, they're actually from some cow costumes that I found in the stores over there. Um, we did try having steel ones once, one, one year, but they, uh, they broke off after a few fights. So um, squashy rubber is, is best. Of course, we've upgraded Matilda several times over the years. Um, she's very good now, but even she falls foul to some of the competitors' robots. Diabolical duo, Razor, reigning world champions. There's the team, Vinnie Blood, Simon Scott, Ian Lewis. Onslaught from Bedford, a dad, son and brother-in-law team. Son David there on the left, and Alan in the middle. Two, one, two, Getting Mark Holland, brother-in-law of Alan, very much a part of the Onslaught team. Didn't fancy this, did they? Let's be honest. They want to stay out of punishing range of Razor dodging around Matilda. How about that? Matilda, you were far too slow there. <laughs> they got in behind Matilda and totally left her for dead. Onslaught trying to stay away from Razor. That's more important, of course. Matilda wants revenge. You can't make me look like a daft old what? I'm not too sure. One hates to think about descriptions for Matilda, really. Stuff of nightmares! Oh, look at that! They've driven straight onto the Razor Beak! And Razor, no! That's Vinnie Blood there with a the thumbs up. They know now they've got Onslaught. They can do with Onslaught exactly what they want. And that is to let them go, because they know they can come in and crash. There was an attack of the Beak weapon. They've got Onslaught by the tyre, by the wheel, a crash. And Onslaught, well, the tyre slightly, only slightly shredded, and it looks to me as if they've got full power and momentum, or have they? Razor again worrying and nagging, and they pace themselves magnificently in this Southern Annihilator to come strong at the end. Onslaught, well, we better have a go. Charging headlong at Razor. Do you know, I, I, I'm not too sure whether they've got full crushing ability or whether they have done throughout. The tyre now fully shredded, so the damage was done. Look at that, the tyre, which had been shredded in the earlier attack, seemed to be OK, but no, it wasn't. And that will be a major problem now for Onslaught's traction on the arena floor. Razor bumps and bashes. Again, almost tentative, though, with the claw. Almost as if they don't want yet to pierce the steel chassis and the covering armour of Onslaught. Onslaught away, beyond Matilda, beyond the flame, spurting out from the arena floor. They're the remnants of its tyres. Oh, what are they doing? What are they doing? Straight back into the CPZ, in comes Razor Onslaught on its side. And I mentioned beforehand, if it was flipped over, it could stream itself right, but not on its side. I don't think so. Against the arena wall, and Matilda pressurised and punctured by Razor. Oh, dear. Look at that. Matilda taking one on the shell. The rear of Matilda has never been quite seen like this before, and I have to say, thank goodness, Matilda is on fire. Razor is destroying Matilda. There's the flame from Matilda. The tusks were raised. I think it was just the last sort of nervous spasm of Matilda. They're in major, major... <laughs> Tildy, what's happened to you? Call on all your friends the house robots. Kill a lot, do the gallant thing, take on Razor. Onslaught's long been for <laughs> forgotten. Matilda, kill a lot. You're a knight of the realm, sir. Get in, sir, and protect your Tildy. No, sir, no such fear. We'll let Tildy bear the brunt of the attack of Razor. Is there anything left of Matilda, I wonder? Onslaught, 
is Sergeant Bash to have a check. There's nothing left of Onslaught, I'm sure. And just when Matilda thought she was away, back come Razor. Down goes the pit. Go on, Chuck Tildy down there. Get Matilda in the pit. Oh, Matilda, what's happened to you, dear? I think it's time you took a long rest, Matilda. <laughs> Go on. Take a long convalescence, Matilda. Kill a lot. Was Kill a lot nudging Matilda towards the pit there, everyone? I'm not too sure. The house robots seem to be teaming up with Razor against poor old Matilda. What's going on? Biddy Blood and the Razor team have won this Southern Annihilator. Poor old Matilda, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. What on earth has happened to the darling of Robot Wars? Matilda, yes, I know it's sad, isn't it? But she is our darling. Oh, Matilda, we will not waltz with you for a while, it would seem. <laughs> on the flame pit again. Well, Onslaught eventually. Dead metal doing the right thing by Matilda. Onslaught in the pit. Razor have won the Southern Annihilator. And now Sir Killalot can come in for revenge. You're a little bit too late, Knight of the Realm. But what's to happen to poor old Matilda from now on in the red pot? Taking one last lingering look, will this be the last we ever see? Of Matilda, I wonder. Razor! Strong enough to be our southern survivors! Matilda, created at the dawn of Robot Wars, R.I.P. Rust in peace, D.I.A. Destroyed in action. D.Y.W.B., do you want a bat? Oh, yes! The matriarch of mayhem, the sister of slice and dice, the grandmother of grinding metal! We'll be back! So that was Matilda. Then I thought, well, it'd be nice to have a good, an army one. It's something that could be, like, in, in sort of 2,000 years' time or something, trolling a planet and keeping the, the locals in order. And the thing about a flamethrower, I always thought, was that it just looked so good in, the, in a studio, any studio environment, flames always look so good. I also thought, well, it, Sergeant Bash would need a, maybe a sort of cutting disc or something, so we put a cutting disc in the back of it. Sergeant Bash is back with new weaponry, hydraulic pincers at the front, and that ferocious flamethrower mounted on a 360-degree turret. This war machine's certain to leave all opponents hot under the collar. So this... Sergeant Bash. He's a great robot. Now, I built Sergeant Bash and designed him in the first series. He's changed a bit since then, but he's always had the flamethrower. The flamethrower is a fantastic weapon. It looks brilliant in a Robot Wars arena, really lights up the arena. Flames look great with all the lights and the other robots around him. Now, Sergeant Bash has particularly got a thing with Deotor, though. He just loves sending light to Deotor. What a run here for Deotor! They're on fire! Oh, great! I'd pay my mission fee just to see this! Look at this! They're on fire! A flame of burning! Deotor! They've got to rebuild it <laughs> all over again! At least the look at the flag on top. At least that's not Cease. smouldering. Diotor have got to rebuild it once again, all over again. Well... So, Mike, tell us about the uh, new difference with Sergeant Bash. Then, what have we got here? Well, the main difference this time round is that Sergeant Bash has got a hydraulic cutting jaw, which generates about eight tons of pressure on the tip here. Now, hydraulics differs from uh, pneumatics, which is what Shunt runs on, in that as opposed to pushing compressed air about, we're pushing compressed liquid about, and because it's liquid and because it's uncompressible, we managed to get a lot more pressure out of it. So a lot more pressure, does that mean a lot more sort of energy, basically, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot, a lot more energy. Um, basically, the, the, the liquid is running around here at about 2,000 pounds per square inch, running into, the, into here, through the ram and out to there, and because of the leverage and the mechanics of how it works, we generate about eight tonnes at the tip here. Uh, Sergeant Bash has got giant hydraulic hoses. These are much, much thicker, much uh, stronger, and can withstand that high pressure. So what else have we got going on at the front here? We've got, what's that, there's a little pump down there. Do you want to talk about the pump? Well, the pump down here is the hydraulic pump. So that generates all the pressure, forces all the liquid into the ram. The pump runs at about 2.2 kilowatts, 
generating, as I said before, 2,000 pounds per square inch of hydraulic pressure. So the design of the jaws here, the shape and the profile and everything was based around the Second World War fighter. The sort of artwork that you see on some of the uh, uh, typhoon fighters from the Second World War, what the Americans painted on their uh, bombers as well. So this is the fiberglass back cover and underneath we've got Sergeant Bash's other weapon which is his gas powered flamethrower. Now this runs on a standard bottle of gas in here. Gas comes out along this orange hose up into the turret here and is operated by an electrically controlled valve and then we, we can manage to fire a flame about 20 feet. Well of course he's had some good times and he's had some bad times and one of his bad times was when he came up against Chaos 2 in Festival of the Flippers in Robot Wars Extreme and he really did have a bad time then. Beaten in the semi-finals of the fourth wars on a judge's decision. I love that massive titanium throw. It can toss 800 kilos, powered by two golf cart motors. I wonder if it'll be hard cheddar for the opponents. Hello, I'm Roger. This is Murray. This is John. We're the Wheelie Big Cheese team from Somerset. This is our robot, all built out of titanium. Toughest robot on the block. Here to smash everything else to bits. The lobster with the claws and that very strong pneumatic CO2 flipper, 15 miles an hour, top speed, 95 kilos in weight. Only Pussycat could stop this in the fourth series of the wars. We're Team Lobster, my name's Dave, this is Ian, this is our robot Thermidor 2. We're angry, we're ready for a fight, keep out of our way. This CO2 powered gas ram spiked flipper comes from an industrial digger, zero ground clearance, 96 kilos, 12 miles an hour, top speeds. My name is Ellie, and this is my brother, Joe, and over here is my daddy, Ian, and this is our secret weapon, a flipper, and this robot is called Bigger Brother. Chaos 2 has never been beaten. It's the reigning British champion. The CO2 flipper's one of the most powerful ever seen. It's thrown more robots out of the arena than any other machine in history. Think you can be successful? Don't forget, there's many a flip, twixt cup and lip, and we have house robots in there, like the heavyweight Matilda with the tusks and the flywheel. And alongside Matilda and fighting for us, Sergeant Bash, watch for its flamethrower. But what a battle of the flippers we have ahead here. Roboteers, stand by. Three, two, one, two, eight. So, who has the bigger flipper? Chaos 2, top of the picture. Thormador goes in for, well, a tentative look, nothing more. Out comes Bash! Thormador gets the first flip in on Bash, who retreats away to fight another day, and he's toppled. Look at this, Thormador straight in, up goes the flipper, Bash flies. Chaos 2 wanted some of the action, and Bigger Brother too, for that matter. And there goes Bash, toppled by Bigger Brother. Already we can see the power of these pneumatic flippers. This is Wheelie Big Cheese, under pressure from Matilda, and takes a bit of a bash, Wheelie Big Cheese. Put those little spikes on the wheels, that's the end of Bash. Wheelie Big Cheese now, under pressure from Matilda there on the arena sidewalk. And Chaos 2, slamming into the... Pit release button, you can hear the siren activated. There's something strange going on, you know, out there. All the robots are attacking the house robots. No one's having a go at each other. Is this some sort of conspiracy against our machines? You, you, you dastardly competitors, you. This is not in the in the rules of house roboteering, I'm sure. Our poor robot, Bash, look, they're ganging up on him. Kill a lot, remember this, this is chaos too. Flipping your friend! It's a flipping frenzy out there, and that's what we wanted. Chaos 2 with George Francis and Bigger Brother, with Ian Watts at the controls and Joe Watts, the weapon operator, is only eight, combining to send Bash up into the air and crashing down into the CPZ. Now they're after the flamethrower. They want to put Bash out of business for all time, I think. Bash into the CPZ and in trouble as the flamethrower's it come off, I wonder. I think the flamethrower has been discombobulated in the corner. The red bot comes in and says, hang on, I've had enough of this. What's going on? This is terrible teamwork against our boys. Matilda wants a little bit of revenge. 
Thermidor gets out of the way. Matilda, oh, is there a tear? I think there's a tear for Bash. Is there something going on between Matilda and Bash that we need to know about? We'll find out in the pits maybe a little bit later on. George France is in there. And Thermidor, the Thermidor team, look at this. With a little flip, not on Matilda, but on Chaos 2. Chaos 2 is overturned. George Francis may smile. And Thermidor 2, at long last, has taken on one of the other competitors here. Now, dodge that flywheel of Matilda. Thermidor 2 taking on Matilda's tusks. That's better. Willie Big Cheese is out of it. I think immobilised top left. Only Thermidor's left to fight here. It's a wearying contest. Too much use of the flipper. Could leave you tired and drained, Six. obviously. Oh, and one last onslaught. Thermidor is the winner of this. Matilda left alone for the house robots. Well done, Thermidor. From Charville, Granny's Revenge. Looks like some horror from a Hitchcock movie, and this is no sweet old lady. Watch for the pneumatic flipper as Gran puts the boot in. From Langport, Axel. Similar overall to Iron Ore, which lost in its Series 4 heats. Most parts made from the packaging machinery has an axe and a flipper. Eight mile an hour top speed sluggish, and the turning circle seems too wide for me. Roboteers, stand by. Two family teams here, the Granny's Revenge boys, Trevor Andrew and his sons George and Philip, and Axor, Gilbert and Robert Grimm, and Adrian Moore, their friend. Sergeant Bash has no friends in the arena with its long-range weaponry. And who likes a kill a lot after all? Well, I do, because he's got crushing claws and that piercing lance. Three, two, one, activate. The ref bot looks on and blinks in disbelief as Granny's Revenge wheelchair enters the arena and turns away. Good to see the blankets on, just to keep you warm, love, out there. OK, now don't go too fast. You mustn't stumble over. Axel doesn't know what to do. Uh, well, you've got to be cruel to be kind sometimes, Axel. And Granny's doing rather well here. She's sort of turning away with the chainsaw. What a nightmare this is. Oh, here comes the flamethrower. Granny's... <laughs> Granny's on fire. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Now, has she got her teeth in? That's what I want to know. Somewhere down in that pit of doom, you know what's down there, don't you? There's an empty beaker with some teeth in it. All grannies have them. Oh, dear. What a rotten end for the Andrew family. Any moment now, there's another lick of flame from Sergeant Bash. Axe or is going to pick Granny's revenge. <laughs> or is she going to do it herself? Go on, you're going to miss the pension down the post office, love. Got to be out of the arena quickly. Oh, who's got in there with her? The ref box got in. Granny's got hold of the ref box. What a dreadful thought. Next robot would be great to have something that maybe looked as if it came from a building site or something and it looked as if it was sort of like a robot that was used on building sites to break up sort of stone and, and shift things around and, and looked very industrial sort of looking robot. So, so then so I thought well an axe and get a really good axe and get welly into other robots, crack holes in them, open them up and that would be a, uh, another good robot. Shunt, a power packed robot capable of dragging a fully loaded Land Rover with its hydraulic lift and the ability to cleave all opponents in two with a pneumatically driven diamond edge axe which strikes with over 500 kilograms of pressure. Recognise this? This is Shunt. And this is Malcolm. Malcolm looks after Shunt and has uh, done since the first series. He was responsible for building Shunt in the very first wars. And he's also responsible for sending all those robots out looking like pepper pots. One puncture mark, two. Into the flame, two. Oh, 
Shunt pickaxe here, wrecking havoc, cutting this. Oh, look at that! The unique um, movement that Shunt has got on his axe um, is actually this. The full range of movement of the arm itself comes right back to here. But the actual force that is pushing it through that movement is this piston here. Basically, the supply of air or CO2, carbon dioxide, <clears throat> comes from this valve, this sort of regulator here, through a series of valves which control the opening and closing, and end up going in through this opening here, which actually pushes, like so, this ram out, and keeps it going all the way down through there. The axe was put on afterwards as a little afterthought, and it's been um, gradually modified and improved um, each year, so it's now become its, its major weapon. Terminator. Trying to get to the 50 points, couldn't get in there, and the house robots now exacting revenge. This time, and there comes the big pickaxe. So, what's one of your finest hours? Have you got one of your I finest moments? I think probably the finest hour um, was involving this, the old axe again. Um, and basically it was a bout in which Hypnodisc was involved. And um, I think uh, Hypnodisc must have had a bit of trouble because um, it, uh, I think it got one of its wheels uh, damaged and it couldn't control itself very well. Three, two, one, activate. Push it out immediately on the attack. Look at that metal, something's come off there, Hypnodisc straight away. It's caused damage to Hypnodisc straight away. I think it caused damage to one of the wheels. I'm not too sure, let's see if one of those wheels is locked up. Pussycat, with their powerful circular blade, the sword blade causing damage to Hypnodisc. There it was, it was, to the rear wheel arch. And I think one of those wheels is locked up, that's why Hypnodisc can't drive. Now if Pussycat can push them into that CPZ, yes, the house robots can take over. They can attack once the machine goes into their corner. The corner patrol zone and shunt is causing damage to Hypnodisc. Will that aluminium and mild steel shell now withstand damage from the house robots? Robot. This is a real shock in the making. I can't quite believe it. No one really gave pushing out a prayer against Hypnodisc, and they are stuck. That wheel is not moving, and look at that. That's damage to the enormously powerful blade of Hypnodisc, and it's stopped working. The blade has been immobilized. There is no weaponry. There is little movement for Hypnodisc. One wheel on your wagon around in ever-decreasing circles, I'm afraid, for Hypnotisk. What a surprise this is! Killalot has come in, and Killalot and the house robots have long awaited this moment. There are a few scores to settle for Hypnotisk. They've been brilliant competitors, I think, the Rose family. Great sports throughout, but they're out of it! Well, 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 that's a typical sporting gesture from the Rose family. Alan Gribble, Robin Herrick and David Gribble are through. I think one of the other good times was Panic Attack. Do you remember when uh, when you were just pepper-potting Panic right. Attack? Down! Oh, that's demonic! And that's evil can evil from Panic Attack! The dead metal's waiting! And in comes Shunt as well with a deadly axe! Piercing and punctuating and puncturing! That spider of Panic Attack! What are they going to do now? Oh, oh, that is the eye of the spidey! And this looks deadly! And going to be a bit more devastating this year as well. Well, uh, we're going to up the pressure by modifying this valve system. At the moment, um, the main um, uh, CO2 or a common dioxide air supply comes through here, through this valve block, and then comes out via this outlet into the bottom of the ram here which pushes the ram forward and as it's pushing forward it has to get rid of the air that's already in the ram so that comes out of here and then comes connected up through that one exhaust out of here quickly and then the whole cycle starts again so this time um, we're going to do away with this block and put some very quick acting valves on which also mean that I can up the pressure a bit from approximately 150 pounds per square inch to about 200 pounds per square inch
Uh, so that was shunned. And then, and then really, I thought with dead metal, I just thought, well, I just think we've got to get something that comes, looks like it comes from a scrapyard. Suddenly, all these pieces from the scrapyard have sort of like run together and formed themselves into, into a robot. And, uh, and it would be good to have a good scorpion sort of tail that came over with a cutter on it and a pair of jaws that you could grab something with as well. So it looked like a cross between a sort of lobster and something that sort of formed from a scrapyard. And this is Dead Metal. Fantastic robot, Dead Metal. It's completely different now from what it was in Series 1 and 2. In Series 1, we had a giant arm that came over backwards. It was a bit like a scorpion. The arm was powered off of a strimmer motor uh, running a grinding disc. It came right over. The jaws grabbed the robot. The arm would chop through the ro robot and grind away at it. In Series 2, we found that the strimmer was a bit unreliable and it just took a long time of mucking around with it. So we replaced the strimmer motor with an electric motor. We replaced the grinding disc with a diamond cutting saw. And this time we ended up with sparks and a much more effective weapon that was able to cut through robots quite easily and it wasn't as much trouble to us. So we still had the jaws, but we had a better cutting disc. So since series three, we've had this. This is much better. This is a devastating weapon, this one. We discovered this and it all comes down to this saw blade. This is a friction saw blade. It spins at about 4,000 RPM, it sends showers of sparks out everywhere. It's the type of blade that's used for cutting big steel sections on building sites. The saw is powered off of a uh, petrol um, motor here. This is an off-cut saw from building sites again. It's a 96cc petrol saw. Delivers masses of energy into this spinning blade. So the, the blade is spun up to speed in no time. It goes up to speed in about a second or so. When we activate it, the whole assembly moves forward. If this moves forward too quickly, the whole blade just jams up. So it's the art of it is to move it forward very, very slowly. As it creeps forward, it just takes big chunks out of robots and it produces fantastic sparks when it's up against titanium. Jaws at the front here, these are pneumatically powered. It's a hydraulic cylinder used, but running off of pneumatics via the uh, carbon dioxide bottles, as I've mentioned before. The, uh, we used to use um, ordinary air cylinders and things, but because this takes so much of a, a shock all the time, so many impacts and so many smashes around, that we were just bending rams all the time. But and since we've had the hydraulic one in, it's just fantastic, it's so reliable. In fact, actually, this hydraulic ram was the original hydraulic ram that used to power the flipper for the first series of Robot Wars. So we just sneaked it and shoved it in dead metal. I've got to say that if I was a contestant in a Robot Wars fight, this is probably the robot I would choose. It's a great robot to take part in the contest with. It's very, very difficult to turn over. It's a great design, it's very effective, and it's certainly the one I would choose. There is smoking and shredded there. Oh, and again, a horrible squeal. Oh, poor Isabel knows that it's all over for thing two. Kill a lot, looking on, dead metal saw.
when did To Kill A Lot come about? Oh, God. Well, To Kill A Lot came about uh, in the second series. We had literally about ten days to build him. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough. And The Kill A Lot was most definitely still being finished as he was being pushed into the van to go down to the studio. And of course, this is Sir Kill A Lot. He is the master of mayhem. Originally had a set of jaws that were from uh, a fire brigade type of jaws that would cut people out of road accidents with. Those jaws, they were powerful enough, they were still powerful enough to do this. But they weren't big enough for what we wanted. We wanted jaws as big as this. Jaws that could actually pick up and grab robots. Jaws that gave us a chance to grab robots in the arena. So we made our own and these came along in series four. So let me introduce you to Killalot's Mr Fixit, the man responsible for sniffing up all those poor robots in Robot Wars. The man himself is Colin. So Colin, then uh, tell us, come on, how's Killer Lot differ from all the other house robots? Well, essentially, the obvious difference is his size. He's about twice the size of any other house robot and about twice the weight of any other house robot. And, of course, the other difference, which helps him quite a lot on stage with pushing power, is he's the only house robot in the arena to have caterpillar tracks on it. Um, these are the same sort of thing as you'd find on a, a, a mini digger or, a, or an earth mover and uh, essentially with his weight, combined with his weight, it means that virtually no robot can push him around the arena at all. And his high powered motors means that he can push practically any robot um, that's, that's in the arena, which, which gives us a distinct advantage. Well, we've got hydraulics here as well, haven't we? What runs the hydraulic system? Well, it's, got, it's a fully articulated hydraulic system, which basically means that both his arms move and he's got two weapons, obviously, which is the, the jaws that Chris has already talked about, but the, and also the drill, which has been quite effective, um, not necessarily from a drilling purpose, but from spiking robots and spinning them round on the end of the drill. Um, I think, have you seen from the show, that the claw is very, very effective at picking up uh, contestant robots and killer lots spinning round in a kind of a victory dance. Killer lot comes in as well. Oh, they're all in for the kill now. And the napalm team know they have this one, possibly by default, because of what's happened to Robo Pig. Killer lot. And I think we could have, we do, Smokey Six. Bacon! And Killer Lot's on fire too! And that's the first time we've seen that in Robot Wars history. Killer Lot taking punishment. It's Porky's revenge. Killer Lot on fire. How about that? Go, Killer Lot. I'm not too sure if he can go anywhere. Well done, Daniel. From St. Leonard's on Sea, East Sussex, Gemini. The original cluster bot. Brilliant design, won the Pinball Warrior event in the last series, but in battle, the flippers haven't caused enough damage, and with the 100 kilo split into the two machines, could again be too lightweight, I fear. From Shrivenham in Oxfordshire, Rough Rough Dougal. A dog with a vicious tongue, internal flywheel to stabilise the robot and drive the weapon made entirely from scrap, old radiators, school desks, bits of cars and computers. The head is a crash helmet. Roboteers, stand by. Gemini team, Shane Howard, Daryl Howard and Brian Fountain and Ruff Ruff Dougal, Peter Sturgis, Martin Sturgis. Matilda's in there again. The flywheel is very dangerous and underrated. But of course, Sir Killalot. No one would dare underrate that killing machine. Three, two, one, action. 
activate. So Gemini can split from the start, but if you immobilize one of those cluster bots, you put the whole thing out of the picture. So will Ruff Ruff Dougal concentrate on one machine, go for both, or simply concentrate on survival? Ruff Ruff Dougal is exposed. There underneath, you can see the very mechanics. You can see the internal flywheel designed to stabilize the robot. It's made out of scrap. And from the evidence of the opening seconds, it's heading back to the scrapyard and not to a safe kennel. Sir Killalot is waiting also to take Rough Rough Dougal for a walk to doom. Gemini nagging and worrying. They look like two little fleas in the dog fur out there. Oh! <laughs> That's brilliant. Here, here, what then? Well, look at this, Steve Benton. <laughs> And off came the ears. Oh, dear, that looks most sad, doesn't it? Superb stuff for the Dougal boys. <laughs> the brothers, Peter and Martin Sturgis, in all sorts of trouble. Gemini, well, one of the cluster bots has almost disappeared and underneath there. Look at that. The side skirts, they call it, on, on a dog like Dougal. If you know your dog shows, the skirts are being ripped away. Oh, dear, the tail's still in there, just about waggling. It's vibrating out there, it's not moving very fast. I think it may well have just nudged the, the pit release. Certainly it has now. Oh, dear, the fur is flying. It's a dog's life, isn't it, Dougal? And the Sturgis boys have already given up hope. Well, whatever they use to make that exterior to Rough Rough Dougal, it wasn't strong enough. They're turned on their side, and he doesn't want a tummy tickle, this doggy. I think it just wants someone in there to save it and take it to a nice warm home and basket by the fire somewhere. Well, Sir Killalot will oblige. Out you go. The end of Rough Rough Dougal. That was great Cease. fun. Magnificent. Brighton, bigger brother. From Lord's Hill, three stakes to heaven. Roboteers, stand by. In the arena for the heat final from the house robots point of view, Shunt. And there with him, Sir Killalot once again, the original master of mechanical mayhem. Three, two, one, activate. Whatever happens, Bigger Brother, one of the most improved robots we've ever seen. Three stakes needs to dance away from that flipper. Cause damage Whoa, with its spinning cutter. Oh, and on the flame pit, they need to get away from there, otherwise the electrics are going to be burnt out. Just getting away, still torch Bigger Brother on the attack again. Three stacks trying to dodge the kill off. Don't go near the arena sidewall. Three stacks. We see what Bigger Brother can do. The relentless Bigger Brother. In goes that shovel like front flipper again. They're getting closer and closer. Three stacks to heaven. Almost out. Bigger Brother. One tactic for little Joe. And his dad Ian. And Ellie as well. Obvious secret of the turn. Shuts up and over as well. You've seen Bigger Brother before in Robot Wars. You would have never guessed this could happen. Never in a million light years. Shunt is furious. So Killalot wants revenge on anything. Grapples with three stags. Unfortunately, you're going to bear the brunt of House Robot's fury, three stags. Bigger Brother wisely staying out of the damage area. Redbot coming in to protect three stags from... Sir Killalot's wrath. Bigger Brother on the attack again. They're back on that arena sidewall. They can't do anything about it, Peter and Danny and Richard. Look at Bigger Brother. Nippy around the arena. 12 miles an hour. Catch me if you can. Catch me if you can. 
No, 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 no. That's a little bit. That's a little bit too ambitious. Ian, don't try and flip kill a lot. I wouldn't. Whoa! Well, it was a novel attack route. Yes, it's probably wise to get away from there. But three stakes to heaven. Well, the ref bots have taken a glance. The wheel was spinning. I think they are technically still mobile. Yes, back they come now. Three stakes to heaven into the fight. So kill a lot after bigger brother. You were unwise to take on Sir Killalot, but bigger brother, what a, an irritating little machine it is. What a fascinating little machine. Turns away, spins once again. All the aggression in this heat final, don't forget for a place in our series semi-finals later on, has come from bigger brother. Three steps again, upended. Bashes down, we know it can run both ways up. Bigger brother. Slamming it onto the sidewall once again. Can three stacks get away now, Ellie? What do you think? Are you pointing a way out of the arena? Refbot, have a look. I think Ellie might have been saying she thinks three stacks are immobile now. And certainly the Refbot agrees with her. You're seconds away here, Ellie, from a famous victory. Three seconds to go before three stacks to heaven are counted out. And bigger brother have famously won this heat final. What a performance, what an improved robot, what a success story. And what enjoyment they've had. So kill a lot. Fumes. Mm, three stegs, we warned you. The house robots want revenge for the attack on Shunt. And you're going to get it from just about every corner now. Get him down into the pit. Oh, bigger brother, gallantry. <laughs> They've all ended up in there. So kill a lot. Not the brainiest, let's be honest. Cease. Just about surviving. Now this is RefBot. It's been highlighted there was a need for a robot that was um, seen as being unbiased. So when robots were were tied together or got stuck together, which happens quite often where they get stuck on the side barriers, they get wedged on the floor, or they get wedged together. And in the past, the house robots have gone in to free these robots. Now, that was seen by, by viewers at home as being a bit confusing. Well, why is that, ha why is that robot being nice? So, uh, so we built RefBot. It was also really useful that he has a fire extinguisher as well, because uh, many cases, now we've got the enclosed box in Robot Wars, we wanted a, a mobile fire extinguisher device that we could go along and put, put fires out. So the, uh, the fire extinguisher here is powered by um, an ordinary fire extinguisher bottle which slots in a little backpack on uh, RefBot's back. The nozzle's unscrewed and an electric solenoid valve is screwed onto the end of where the fire extinguisher nozzle usually goes, which comes in very handy when things like Killalot catches light or any robots catch light. And he's used many times to push dead robots off the, uh, off the arena and out of the, uh, the fight zone. In the fifth year, it was uh, decided that really it, it, we want a way to, to count robots out. Um, so, so we want him to be able to, to, uh, to have a counting device from 1 to 10, so that if robot looks as if it's stopped, it has 10 seconds. If it moves in those 10 seconds, it can carry on. If it doesn't move in those 10 seconds, it's out. Now, one of the things a lot of people say to me when they see these robots for the very first time in, when they're real is that, gosh, that's so much bigger than I imagined it to be. Most people think these robots are about that high, very small pieces, something not much bigger than a sort of radio-controlled car or something like that. Um, but this, I mean, is a very powerful piece of equipment. Even RefBot is capable of pulling a car along. In Killalot's case, he's capable of pulling a lorry along. They're dangerous pieces of equipment, need to be treated with a lot of respect, and they weigh quite a lot as well. I mean, RefBot here weighs about 160 kilos. Killalot weighs 520 kilos. And the red light. Now, Killalot gets quite a few red lights, and a few of the other house robots have as well. I don't think it's justified myself. together. Stinger on the left, Plunderbird on the right-hand side, and there's the Scorpion team as well. A little Sarah Bell. For us, dead metal with the pincer, the 3,000 RPM sword. Also thrown in for fun, shunt with the axe and the scoop. 
three against two. We still think they're good odds. There's the three. Here come R2. Shunt first of all against the Scorpion with that cutting disc at the back. Shunt beginning to move away from Scorpion. There's Stinger being thrust away by Dead Metal. Well, they're very brave to go in against our house robots. We know that because house robots are out of the CPZ. They can do whatever they want in this. No holds barred. And we've got the flipper as well. Sorry, didn't we tell you about that? Ha ha! Too late now, isn't it? To find out what we've got up our sleeve. We've got weapons like that and axle grinders and flamethrowers and torches and goodness knows what. We're not going to lose this, let me tell you. There's dead metal in on Stinger. Now beginning to be a little bit frightened, are we? Stinger activates the pit button. Who's going to go down there? Is that a little bit rash? Scorpion being tagged. Who had to go? The ref bot there. He's not part of it. Shunt with a little push and Plunderbird have gone. Well, they were hardly in the action there at all, were they? Brian Kilburn and Mike Onslow. There's Stinger, but Dead Metal is making a cursory glance, rather cumbersome push as well, and Shunt has the Scorpion of Jeff Smith and John Bell and his daughter Sarah. Scorpion has been pinched and stung. Stinger's still alive, just about. Scorpion can't get away. Stinger's been clutched by Dead Metal. The wheels are spinning, but there's no one at home, boys. Down in the pit, they cry. <laughs> the Scorpion's on the flame pit. Again, you see, we hold all the aces. Were you brave or were you foolhardy? Who volunteers these days for anything? You did. Ha <laughs> ha, we've got you now, says Dead Metal. Stinger in the clutches. Oh! And we forgot to give you another little item of news. We can bring on a substitute, like Matilda. Bye-bye, Scorpion. Yes, our sting in the tail was our sub, our super sub, the pretty Matilda. And Stinger's all that's left, and there's little left of Stinger. Inside those wheel ups, all the electrics and all the mechanics and all the machinery. And we're going to mash it and bash it and tear it and slice it. Dead metal's in there as well. Matilda comes in with a flywheel spinning. Down, down, go, go, go. Only seven seconds for Stinger to survive. But we have our revenge. The house robots came out to play and they've enjoyed their picnic in the arena and how. So, new house robots. Mm. <laughs> Are there are some plans for new house robots. Uh, yeah. Uh, it'd be, um, we're really looking forward to it. It'd be really exciting, actually. I mean, in this case, um, it looks as if it's going to be uh, a, little, a pair matching or a pair together. It's going to be uh, almost sort of um, uh, what's his, um, the bull, Bullseye and Bill Sykes from uh, Oliver Twist, but robotic versions. So uh, the working titles for them at the moment is Pitbull and Sykesy. Uh, the uh, Pitbull one will have a great big jaws. It's going to be Nasher of the Robot Wars. And uh, it's going to be able to drive in, grab hold of robots, drive out, drive around with them, and then shove them down the pit. It's just going to love biting robots, basically. It's going to have hydraulic chomping jaws uh, and uh, gripping jaws and a really good tracked uh, or it won't be a track chassis, it'll be a skid steer chassis, which is tornado type chassis, but very powerful motors and able to really shove things around. And then the big daddy of them all, if you think Kilolot's big, you wait till you see Sykesy. <laughs> it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a track chassis again, but it'd be it'd probably it'd be a bit taller than Kilolot. Um he's gonna have a great giant club that he can beat robots to death with. So the intention at the moment is to literally bash the hell out of them. <laughs> In the, the best thing about Robot Wars, I think, is it gets young people interested in engineering. And it makes engineering cool. It's getting all sorts of people, it's getting females involved in it as well. I mean, you've got now a really great robot in the female team of the Widow's Revenge, when they took on their husbands in, uh, in, with Razor. I mean, Razor was a bit, I think Razor was a bit wicked, really, going in and, and trashing it so badly. I've no doubt they had a lot of problems fixing it. But I think, actually, at the end of the day, the husbands fixed it for them, probably. <laughs> but uh, it was good. And, uh, of course, we came in and mopped up afterwards as well with Matilda, with its devastating weapon. The worst weapon in Robot Wars, I think, at the moment, Matilda's flywheel. I 
I'm Simon Scott, Captain Team Razor. I'm Ian Lewis, back with Razor, with new uh, thick bodywork, heavier front end, and much better transmission, much stronger. And I'm Vinny Blood. We've still got this same awesome weapon, this awful hydraulic squeezer, three tons on that tip. Dear, we've never seen a team like it. Thank goodness. And the Razor Boys. Matilda, whose side will she be on for a start? I think you can guess. So it could be the sergeant doing it for the boys. Who knows? Three, two, one. So let's be honest, Razor team. If you win, uh, you've got no homes to go to. It's your decision. Chasing on the Widow's Revenge and the Rolling Pin. Revenge is a meal eaten cold, too. But Razor fears not and comes in crumpling. And now, somewhere underneath there, apparently, is a handy compact mirror, some tweezers, and uh, there's a bit of lipstick in there somewhere. Oh! What's happening to Fifi and Madame Gilly? And Madame M, their robot's being trashed by the puncturing beak of Razor. Oh, something flew off. The bit release button sounds doom and gloom for Widow's Revenge. No quarter asked nor given. Divorce lawyers are on the phone. Widow's Revenge are on the flames. The housekeeping money will be used now to repair Widow's Revenge for months ahead, or will it? I think some new wardrobe could be uh, a good idea, boys. Oh, ball boy, weasel and potato features. That's what they think of the partners. The Red Bot counting Widow's Revenge down. Splendid Robot Wars entertainment. This is really what it's all about. Hatred. Razor in on the attack. In it goes again. And Widow's Revenge are out of it. In comes the sergeant. Now, you should protect the gallant ladies, gallant sergeant. Matilda, what are you doing? Sisters of Mercy. The Widows are infuriated. Girl power, that certainly was from our Matilda. The Widows come crashing back down to Earth. I think they've actually done something to our fourth floor flipper there. They sort of wedged it open. Oh, Razor! There's nothing left of it. Be merciful. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. And this ungallant attack on Widow's Revenge gets the thumbs down, and quite rightly so. Well, I I wonder if Razor gave them any advice there on how to build a robot. If they did, it was sneaky. Very good against something early on, but now your robot is trash and is about to be binned, because I think your partners may have given you some duff advice. Matilda looks on. Oh, Razor! They've driven into the pit! I hope you enjoyed your trip around the Robot Wars workshop. And remember, with guys like this around, chaos and carnage will always reign supreme in the Robot Wars arena. Remember, building robots is dangerous and shouldn't be attempted without great care. For more information or if you'd like to build a robot, you must first join the Robot Wars Club. Send a cheque or postal order for £12.95 to Robot Wars London, W1A3AR. If you build a qualifying robot, your membership fee will be refunded. For more information or if you'd like to come and see the amazing spectacle of Robot Wars being recorded live, call our hotline or visit our website.